welcome to this lecture in the lecture series running up to the conference on the Greek case in the Council of Europe that will take place uh, in the middle of December. And by the way, of course, we hope to see you all there. Um, the lecture series and the conference are co-organized by the three Scandinavian institutes, the Norwegian, the Swedish and the Danish, and uh, the Dutch Institute and the Marangopoulos Foundation for Human Rights. Um, and uh, when joining our strengths this way, we can have interesting lecturers from, from all the different countries. Um, so tonight, uh, this lecture is hosted by the Norwegian Institute in particular. So our speaker is a professor from Norway, namely Siri Gloppen. Um, and she will speak on this topic in pursuit of international accountability for human rights violations 50 years after the Greek case. And it is because of the 50th anniversary that we are doing this whole thing this autumn. Siri Gloppen is a political scientist. Uh, she is currently Professor of Comparative Politics uh, at the University of Bergen in Norway, which is, by the way, also the university to which the Norwegian Institute uh, now belongs. She is also Director uh, of a center run jointly by the University of Bergen and uh, the Christian Nicholson uh, Institute, uh, namely a center there for uh, specialized in law and social transformation. She is also a board member of a Norwegian uh, foundation, uh, Rafto Foundation for Human Rights, and she has served as chair for the Rafto Prize Committee, the Human Rights Prize. And she is also a board member uh, in Amnesty International Norway. With a research focus in the intersection between law and politics, uh, her work spans across many fields, uh, legal mobilization and the role of courts in social transformation, democratization and institutionalization of accountability structures, constitution making, election processes, human rights, transnational justice and reconciliation. Her main empirical focus is Southern and Eastern Africa, but uh, she uh, has also worked on abortion rights in Latin America, and uh, more generally on female judges in fragile states uh, and much more. So, without any further lecturing, I will give the word, give the floor to see. Well done. Uh, thank you very much, and thank you all for inviting me and for, to you all for coming. I've been looking forward to this a lot. So, uh, I have a tendency of speaking a bit fast, so please uh, just raise your hand if you want me to repeat or clarify anything. Um, so, yes, so... Oh, yes, so I can... Good. And I can start interesting you also hear me if I don't use... Yes. No, I need to use the microphone because of that. Yes. <laughs> so I'll stand. Yes, so I'll start by Um, I'll then say a little bit about what has happened since, 
in terms of using international law and courts and tribunals to hold uh, perpetrators accountable for uh, human rights violations. And I'll say a bit about the, the criticism in particular, but also the praise for these efforts. And then I'll go into some areas where that has been, been that are quite sort of current areas, some of the areas in which this play out. And, and then end by saying something about sort of some of the challenges ahead. So, I think we sometimes think of law as something very different from politics. We think about decisions that are made, that are legal, as objective in some way and different and not political. But if we think about international law and the history of international law, the main, the main and also domestically, but if we think about it in terms of international law, the main impetus, the main driver is that through international law and through international dispute resolution, we can prevent war. It's trying to channel conflicts, political conflicts, conflict into different and less violent arenas. So, so it is in that sense it's inherently political. It's a way to solve political disputes. And the fact that they are done through law don't take away all the politics of the decisions, but it transforms it in some way. But it's important to remember. And the, that what we try to do is to take some areas out of the day-to-day -day politics. Political decisions are made to take out some, some areas because it's necessary to have some rules of the game that are not disputed all the time, that, are, that, that we can play by, that create expectations because we need also because we need to, to resolve disputes in countries and between countries. And part of this is that we decide politically that there are certain values that are so important that they need to be safeguarded, that we can agree on are so important that they need to be safeguarded and human rights are among these. And what is important is that most of the international human rights system that we know today has its roots first after the First World War and then after the Second World War and it's the, viol it's the gross human rights violations in these wars that push the countries to agree that these norms would be, you know, so as it were, taken out in politics. But it's, it's still, uh, the legal sociologist would say that law is frozen power. It, it's taken out, but it's decided. It's power that, they, that can decide that this is law. And uh, although you can have philosophical the justifications of human rights uh, to show that it has a sort of philosophical foundation, it has a foundation in many religions, so it's, it's not only politics, but it's, there's still, it still requires a political decision to make it into an international legal system. So, so that's, that's important to remember. Uh, but still, when we make this system, we say that something is law. We, could, we say something is a legal domain, and it's not all in play in all political decisions. We need sort of the long term that making them into law and long term can, can provide. At the same time, by doing that, we also create a different political arena. We can use different groups, can use the law in order to advance different goals. And these goals, sometimes we call this lawfare, that you play you, you do, it's in a way, war by legal means. Sometimes it's, it's used for military purposes, but it can also be used by, for a lot of social purposes. And sometimes if you say that it's lawfare, it, some would say that you also say that it's illegitimate. 
But that's not the case. It can be done for the, it can be lawful regardless of whether you agree on the, on the goal or disagree on the goal. The, the characteristic is just that you use the law, either legislation, pushing for different types of legislation, doing advocacy for new laws, go to court with court cases of different kinds to, have, to, to push for a, political, for a political goal, or you can use human rights rhetoric in different types of fora in order to, to push for a political, for new policies or a political decision or push, as in this case, the country to do something that it wouldn't otherwise do. That you could have used to other political means or uh, military means to achieve, but you choose to use the law. So that's what I'll, I'll talk about as the international human rights law for in this sense. And that brings us to the Greek case. And most of what I'm going to say now is from an article by Beckett from 1970. James Beckett, and some of you might have read it. It's, it's particularly interesting because it's, it's uh, written at the very same time. This was the report to the American Bar Association that was written at the same time. So it's sort of a, it's, it's in a way a time witness account of the story that I find particularly interesting. And I recommend you all to read it. It's very enjoyable. It's an enjoyable history. Um, of course, the background was the coup d'etat in uh, 1967. And five days after the coup, the Council of Europe where Greece was a member, Greece had ratified the European Convention on Human Rights and was a member of the Council of Europe. And they, and the, and the Consultative Assembly of the Council of Europe called for restoration of the constitution and parliamentary democracy in Greece. Which of course did not happen. And two months later, the Senate Committee in a resolution expressed the wish that uh, the God, uh, that some of the parties to the, the convention would take the Greek government to the, the European Human Rights Committee. This was, uh, this was a bit complicated because at this time the Committee for Human Rights, which later became part of the Court of Human Rights, was already a functioning body. It had had around three and a half thousand uh, applications, but mainly from individual, from individual uh, members. And the problem was that Greece had not ratified the optional protocol that, or the, uh, that would allow individuals to bring cases against the regime. So you couldn't have a normal case, as it were, before the Commission, because that was, that, that was not an option in the Greek situation. So the only possibility was for another member state to bring the case to court. And this happened in, uh, on the 20th of September. Uh, then, the, this is in 52 years ago. In Norway, Sweden and Denmark filed identical applications and uh, a week later the Dutch followed. And they they, the charges were that Greece uh, had committed um, violations that, uh, that human rights violations that were that ran counter to most of the provisions. Many of the provisions, eight in in the in the founding, founding treaty of uh, of the Council of Europe. And then later, the, um, the, there were more reports of torture that came out, and the charges were extended um, to. And so, so politically, this was really, really important. It was important. It is something quite radical that the Senate Committee does when they they, they, they ask someone to bring to bring the case to to the the Commission on Human Rights. And it's and it's politically crucial because if the if if the Council of Europe had had not been able to deal with these fundamental breaches of its founding treaties and of the of the the convention for, human, for European Convention for Human Rights, that would have rendered it a very very weak instrument. It would have basically delegitimized 
the 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 convention and the and the and the Council of Europe. At the same time, it was politically really really difficult because if you to to sort of go beyond uh, protesting and actually expelling uh, Greece from the Council of Europe would require. Uh, and a very broad consensus that was not politically uh, possible at that stage. So to bring it to the Council of Europe, where both a report could be made, um, the, um, a mediation process could be made to try to resolve the conflict, was a way to try and uphold the rules of the, of the Council of Europe, uh, and at the same time do something by using the law that would have been difficult to do just politically. And so it was politically crucial, and um, it was potentially costly for, for these countries. They did not have anything directly at stake. They didn't have any and that is what is really interesting, and was the first time that it happened, that, that countries that didn't have any personal or national interest at stake uh, took the case. Uh, which could be costly, but in some ways you could also say that it was politically opportune. And then I'm using the picture that uh, <laughs> for this event because in the in the in the Scandinavian countries in particular, this the 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 coup in Greece was a very it was was really something that people cared strongly about. There was an uproar. There was a demand that. The, the government should do something, and that the, 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 the Europe should do something. So there was also possibly, you could argue, political gain to be made domestically in these countries by showing courage and, and stepping forward. And that's also interesting because it also sort of shows that there are politically, political dynamics at many levels that are important when, when something like this happens. The, 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 when the witness hearings started, and you, you really should read about this, there was a lot of different types of pressures and drama. One of the things that happened was that two of the witnesses brought by the Greek government, they jumped ship and they, uh, they went to the Norwegian Commission and said they would testify against Greece. And they were, and, and, and the, the, the commission decided to hear them in secret, and they took testimony. And, and uh, then, sometime late, later, they jumped ship again, and they ended up with the, with the Greek embassy in Sweden claiming that Jens Evans and the Norwegian head of the delegation <laughs> that had basically kidnapped them and forced them into testifying, and they wanted to, and they wanted to, to change their uh, their statements, but uh, but before, the, then the commission said that then they would have to be in total secret, so none of the parties, not even the Greek government, could be there to listen to what they said, and then it never happened. They they disappeared and went back to Greece. So you could just sense some of the political political drama around this. And, and there was also uh, a lot of uh, political, um, very strong differences in political views of what was the best uh, thing to do, whether to, whether to uh, expel Greece or to keep them in, and particularly the Americans didn't want to expel Greece from the Council of Europe, and, and there was a lot of different, a lot, at that time, a lot of pressure on the different countries to withdraw. Which was the case. But then in October 1969, the subcommission adopted the, the report, sent it to the full commission, which adopted the report. They had at that stage also tried to negotiate a solution, which, which didn't work. They, they managed to, uh, the Scandinavians would not accept anything uh, beyond stopping torture. The Greek accepted that the, the Red Cross could. Could, could come and investigate, but what really didn't, uh, where it really stopped was on the, on, the, um, on the setting of a date for elections. So it went into the, into the full commission and was sent to the foreign ministers of the member states. 
And this was a secret report. And, it, and, and as I said, there was a lot of political wrangling at this time. So, and you can see this. This is, is what you always see in a lot of conflicts now. Some say it's better to just expel, you deter others, but you also make it easier for the opposition in Greece, Greece to take power. Others say, no, 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 we need to keep them in. We need to be able to continue dialogue. We need to influence them to make the regime more liberal. Um, uh, as I said, we had the US tried to keep them in, but then the report was leaked to the press. And that changed the game. When you had the headlines in the British papers, you had reports of torture, which were already in the press, but when the Commission of Europe report said that there were systemic torture, that, that really changed the, the, the game and it was very difficult for the Council of Europe not to vote for, for expelling, expelling Greece. But before they could do that, Greece walked out and, and uh, denounced the, the European Convention of the Union Rights. So, uh, so, this is a story of law, of using the law, but it's also a story that shows how important the political dynamics around it is. So this could not have been done without the legal mechanisms. The report of the Council of Europe, the role of the Council of Europe, the, of being a court, even though it's a commission and, and, and only could issue advisory opinions, of having this judicial authority of of uh, uh, laying out evidence in a very clear way, of having this report that was, that was very difficult to find faults with, was crucial in order to do the political decision, but it would was a, probably not have been enough if you didn't have the other political dynamics, the other game that was played in different arenas, in other arenas, in, in this case, in the press. So, as I, as I said already, what was, what was central, this was not the first case of having international, uh, having states uh, go against each other in international uh, courts. That had happened before. Actually, Greece had brought a case against Britain over Cyprus in the Commission of, on Human Rights. Um, but, and it had happened in the Court of Justice, but what was new was that Norway, Sweden, Denmark and the Netherlands, they did not have a stake. They took the case to the Council of Europe based on what they saw as a common obligation to human rights. So, it's a, so, it, so it, in that sense, it was a first. And in the 50 years since, there has been an explosion of different cases of all kinds, particularly um, uh, there has been, a, been an explosion in different courts and tribunals that cases can be brought to. A lot of cases, a lot of different courts and tribunals have human rights as part of their, of their jurisdiction. There are, also, um, uh, there are also a lot of cases that are brought in, in uh, particularly by individuals, both the European Court of Human Rights the Inter-American Court of Human Rights, and also, uh, and also some committees like the Committee uh, Against uh, Discrimination Against Women, Child Rights Commission, the Human Rights Commission, Commission for People with Disability, they take our cases from individuals and make pronunciations on them on, regarding human rights. So there are a lot of different places where individuals can go. So that is the big, big, big amount of the cases that are taken to international courts and they're important in different ways and I'll come back to that. But there are also many well, the new ways in which individuals can, like states, can bring cases to, to, uh, to international courts and bodies against other states over human rights violations. And um, this uh, includes cases of uh, where they take individual leaders to account. So it's not only about governments, as in the Greek case, but it is about individual members of those governments or in the individual, individual state officials. 
And the most important body for doing that is the individual criminal court uh, from 2002, and also which had, and the previous ad hoc tribunals for Rwanda and the former Yugoslavia and some special courts for different, for different countries. So this is also about the international community and, and, and different countries taking individual leaders uh, of uh, members of government to court. And another version more or less of the same is that, that many, most countries of the world actually um, have some form of what's called universal jurisdiction where certain crimes that are seen as particularly grave can be brought before the normal courts in a country even if the perpetrators are from other countries, victims are from other countries, and the crimes were made done in other countries. So, uh, but, but the claim is that these, these cases are so important that it can be brought, brought in. So, due to all these developments, the, the area of international uh, accountability seeking, if you want, for human rights, but also what I call international law track has expanded. <laughs> and some of the some of the praise for this development uh, has been that it it, put, it be a, in addition to the peacekeeping function that I mentioned earlier, which goes to the international dispute resolution. It says these that these uh, mechanisms to enforce international accountability for uh, human rights violations they provide a possibility for justice and recognition for victims of the crimes committed against them. And that is, is sort of in material terms a very important function. And also, as in the, in the Greek case, it's a way to uphold common norms, common human rights norms, uh, to, put a, uh, to put a line on an unacceptable act, uh, sort of just marking that this, these, these, these are, are unacceptable actual acts in the international, in the international arena. Um, it's, uh, it's also, and, and that is a claim particularly made when it comes to the individual accountability for special crimes, genocide, crimes against humanity, war crimes, torture, that is also, uh, where there is also universal jurisdiction. Uh, it is that this is a way to deter future perpetrators. If, if uh, leaders of, of the government can be held accountable, criminally accountable, for violations by the international society, that can deter others. In addition, and that's what I marked with red, there is this part of the praise is also about the political function that this, this place, that it is international courts, not least in individual cases, is an arena that can make it possible for human rights reform actors in different countries, actors who are concerned with human rights and the rule of law, to get the case to an international body and then get leverage, push for reform in their country via the courts, via shaming the government internationally. So the, the political function is also what is, is, is sometimes uh, strongly praised and seen as important. <laughs> then the, the criticism, there are a lot of different ones, and I'll, I'll pick on some, but one is the, goes to the question of whether it actually does deter future perpetrators. The deterrence in criminology is often questioned. Usually, Many criminologists would say that those who are deterred are usually those who would not commit the crime anyway. That deterrence is overrated. And that is also a claim that is made at the international level, that there is little evidence that it is deterring. And some would say that in this context, it actually could be counterproductive. It could make it more difficult to get leaders to actually leave office that leaders who have committed grave human rights violations would cling to office with more desperation if they know that if they leave, they and their followers will be held accountable internationally. And that it makes it difficult to negotiate peace agreements. It makes it difficult 
to get transitions. So these are claims on both sides, but that is part of the criticism that is, is being. Another major criticism that is being made against international uh, human rights accountability um, is, goes to this question of upholding common norms. And particularly from African countries and Asian countries, there has been an increase, but also to some extent from Eastern Europe, there is a, uh, there is a, and other places, there is this, this criticism that, that these are not really common norms, these are really norms that are predominantly the way they are understood and the way they are enforced, uh, Western norms norms of uh, power holders, that they're neocolonial in their nature, they don't, uh, they don't take account uh, of Asian values, African values, and that is becoming a very important criticism. It's been there for a very long time, but it's becoming more, uh, it's becoming louder. And another one that is, is uh, that goes to this, uh, this, um, uh, the issue of, of, of human international courts creating a space for pro-human rights actors is the counter-argument that is actually shared by quite a few people within the human rights community is that this, is, this can be too much, it can take up too much of what is actually should be decided in by democratic means. That it's, that it's, um, that it's a breach of sovereignty of the state, but also when, when governments uh, are told what to do by international bodies in issues that should be a national concern and that should be a democratic concern. And, and so that is also part of this. this, this uh, there is always a, a question of, of where the line between democracy and law goes, but that is also being discussed a lot. lot. Are some of these cases stepping over the line? Again, there are no... I don't have any clear answers, but these are some of the, some of the criticisms and of course, one of the concerns by those who, who supported in who support the effort towards human rights accountability is the, the issue of backlash. That by pushing for human rights of a certain kind, you can create political mobilization against it and make the political mobilization against it stronger. And that is, a, or again, uh, an issue that is becoming more of a concern. When is this happening? And one of the most, maybe, significant areas where this is being discussed, not the only one, but one of the most significant ones is in the area of sexual and reproductive rights. So this is from a protest in Moscow, as you can see. But in many parts of the world, um, uh, and, and Russia is one of the cases, uh, one of the countries that where the European Court of Human Rights has given judgment against the, the, the Russian state on issues of discrimination of, of, uh, of uh, people based on sexual orientation and gender identity. And, and this issue, issues, other issues related around uh, abortion, um, individualization, sexual violence, these are issues that are brought to domestic but also to international courts and tribunals in all parts of the world, in, in many, many uh, different fora. And in most of the cases, and for the longest period, have uh, been brought before the international, the European Court of Human Rights, but now they're, they're all over, all, all over the world, including, including uh, you, both coming through the, the domestic systems to appeals to international courts. Usually, you have to exhaust the domestic. You have to go through the the, the domestic court system in order to get to get to the international level. But but sometimes they're also brought directly. Uh, particularly to the International Criminal Court and issues around sexual violence and war in particular and the use of rape. And these are areas where there is a lot of political debate around to what extent this is an imposition of liberal Western norms and 
It has led, it's one of the issues that has led to a mobilization against some of these courts in, in some instances. It's also, uh, you know, it, it's also interesting the way in which sometimes judgments in these cases can give those can give sort of a political advantage at the local level. So I'm going to, to just use one case for illustration. And that was, it was not actually a decision. It was as actually in the, in the, uh, in the Greek case in some ways, it, it was an opinion. So the, the Kostamika had sent um, a request to the Inter-American Court of Human Rights for an opinion in the case of same-sex marriage, which was banned in the country at the time. And in January 2018, the Inter-American Court of Human Rights gave its opinion and said that, uh, that uh, Costa Rica would have to give uh, homosexual couples the same rights to marry as heterosexual couples. So, this was just the month before the election. And what happened was that Fabrizio Alvaraldo, who was a, who was a, Alvaraldo, who was a, a quite famous evangelical pastor, he, but not a very big actor in the, in the election game, get, suddenly got a bit, he, he was using the election campaign to, to argue against the, the, the inter-American court, both for the substance of the opinion, but also for, uh, for the interference. And he got a strong, strong boost in the election, and he won the first round of the election to win, but he didn't get an absolute majority, went to the second round, and then he lost, but he got 40%. And it was clearly the only reason, the opinion from the Costa Rican case was clearly the main reason why he, he was able to, to, to make the political, the political uh, comeback or the, the campaign. And then uh, later that year, Costa Rica, the Supreme Court of Costa Rica followed the Inter-American Court, struck down laws, banning gay marriage, and also said to the, to the politicians, if you don't get new laws in place in a year and a half, this will be law. So the Costa Rican Supreme uh, Court is also very strong in that case, taking over a lot of space, which would otherwise be a democratic space. So, so that's one. Uh, and the, but, what is interesting in these cases, this was in a way unusual because it's confined to Costa Rica. Another case that Costa Rica brought to the Inter-American Court over in vitro fertilization saw more than a hundred organizations from around the region and internationally sending, from all sides, sending opinions. Uh, were often called, called Amica Curia briefs, friends of the court to offer their opinions. And it was a big effort on all sides to try and and that's something that we're seeing in these cases. We also see that uh, not only those who want to expand human rights in this sense go to court, or more often seen as liberal or progressive actors if you want, but also those who want to restrict, for instance, rights to abortion, use the courts a lot. <laughs> and one of the things that we see is, uh, and that also regards uh, the Scandinavian countries, is that do you know what conscientious objection? Um, uh, in Norwegian it would be reservationsrecht, the right not to participate in abortions or other actions that you don't want to participate in for uh, reasons of your conscience or religious reasons. Is, uh, this case, there is a case uh, before the, the European Court of Human Rights now where, where um, the midwife in Sweden went to the, to the, the court to complain in Sweden that her right to conscientious objection was violated. The case is not decided, but what is interesting, and the, one of the reasons why I wanted to show it for illustration now, is that it's supported by Alliance Defending Freedom International, which is involved in many, many of these cases on the, on the more conservative side. It's originally an American, a US-based organization, and it, but it has offices in Europe and it collaborates with a lot of other, other organizations in Europe, both politically and, 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 uh, and, um, and more sort of uh, NGOs in the world. And what their, uh, their goal, which is clear on the website, is 
that they are advocating for the sanctity of life, marriage and family, and religious freedom, coming alongside lawmakers to help shape legislation, working through international courts and institutions to engage world leaders and the family of faith, partnering with individual organizations and general missions for reforming the legal culture, and, uh, and championing many individuals to take up their steps. So this is a uh, this, is a, this is an organization that has a very clear way aim to use different types of legal sites to advance, to advance their laws. Uh, there are others. One is a Polish-based organization called Ordo Juris, which, uh, which is a Catholic organization. And what is interesting is that these are engaged, so these are generally engaged a lot in LGBT and abortion cases, but they're also engaged in cases that for Norwegians are really interesting. They're also engaged in cases engaged in with child protection services. Some of you will know that there was a third decision today against Norway in the European Court of Human Rights in cases regarding the Norwegian abortion uh, child protection services. And the, this is a Polish organization. I don't know if it's in this. Yeah. So, and there's a lot. so this is a big, the, this is maybe the big, has been one of the big uh, foreign relations issues for Norway in the last years. A lot of, a lot of, um, of demonstrations around, around Europe and the world. And if you go into the website of this organization in Poland called Ordo Juris, you will see that they are really, they, are, they don't have the case actually on the European Court of Human Rights, but yes, okay. Um, but, but, uh, they, they have, no one, but they have, they have a lot of, uh, of they, they provide amicus briefs in these cases, and they are not very prominent on their website. So why is that the case? The reason is, of course, that all of these issues, also like for lines defending freedom, they center on the, the family. And they're against gender ideology. And they're very liberal gender ideology, and the Norwegian Child Protection Services, with the, they are seen as, as um, and, and to some extent, the Scandinavian welfare states are seen as, as uh, feminist. They're seen as, as, um, as destructive and dangerous to the idea of the natural family. So this is quite interesting. The way in which. Uh, and, uh, and, and of course, on the more liberal side, for instance, in abortion cases, we also find international organizations like the Center for Reproductive Rights in the US are involved in almost all the cases around the world, around abortion. So what is interesting is that these, there are a lot of organizations who use, so most of, like, most of the cases that come to Norway, about Norway and the European Court of Human Rights, they're brought by people who are desperate feel that they've been violated. That's the truth. That's true with most of these hundreds and thousands of cases who are brought to international courts. Some of them are brought strategically, but what you often see is that even cases that are not brought strategically will get support or they will get involvement from organizations who use these cases as a main playing field for advancing their political goals, which you can agree with or disagree with. But it's interesting to see the ways in which both sides are fighting uh, over this and where the question of how to secure international human rights accountability also becomes a question of how can you advance a political vision that is important to you. So, <laughs> this is another very famous case that uh, concern the president and vice president of Kenya. Uhuru Kenyatta was uh, um, was well. I'll start at the beginning. So in twenty in twenty two thousand and seven, there was an election in Kenya that was followed by a lot of violence, many people killed, and it was seen to be most investigators and, and observers domestically and internationally saw this violence as being instigated for political reasons. 
In 2010, the International Criminal Court started investigating responsibility for the violence, and they said that six leaders, including the then Deputy Prime Minister, Kenyatta, and the Education Minister, Ruto, that they, were, they would be charged with crimes against humanity. Then, what happens a year later? Kenyatta, who is charged with crimes against humanity, wins the election with Ruto, who was his opponent, but then, because they were on different sides uh, in the 2007 election, but he is then vice president. So the two of the, the most two most prominent people charged by the ICC uses it in the election campaign. They argue against international interference in the election campaign. And that is, they use it for their gain and they win the election. Which of course is problematic for the International Criminal Court because then they, they clearly have a democratic mandate and, and it creates a political, a political uh, problem. But they continue with very complicated and problematic hearings and witness collections. The Kenya's National Assembly voted to leave, or it gave them indication that they would leave the ICC. The, the trial of Ruto began in, also in later in 2013. The, in, in December of 2014, the charges against Kenyatta were dropped by the ICC. And in 2016, the charges against Ruto was dropped. So this was a really, really big disappointment for the International Criminal Court, a big setback for international justice. And, uh, and part of the reasons why they were dropped was that there was so much interference with the witness collection that they weren't able to make a case. They also, um, after they tried to, to um, uh, arrest in South Africa the, the, the Sudanese president, who would also, was also charged by the ICC, the African Union encouraged its members to withdraw from the ICC. And after and since several African and Asian countries have withdrawn or has indicated there that they will do so. So this is is this is maybe the clearest case where you see that this is is really that the international courts can't really do things unless they are that they have a have a democrat or a political backing. It's a difficult, it's a difficult uh, uh, game to play, and it's in, and in, and for the international criminal court, of course, the biggest problem is that the big countries like the U.S., China, India, the big Russia, the big perpetrators in many ways of war crimes, they are not even part of the jurisdiction of the court, so they can't be. Be, uh, be, um, they can't be brought before them. And it is a very difficult, it's a very difficult um, uh, balance to play. Um, and, and, and it shows some of them, it shows in a way both real strength and weakness, because it shows that these regimes also fear the ICC, which is why they want to withdraw, but it also sees, shows a strong weakness of of particularly the ICC, but also other international courts. However, last week was interesting, then, and that goes to the issue of international uh, criminal courts, or uh, at least human rights responsibility. You all, I'm sure you know about, during a crisis and case in, in Myanmar, and of all the, uh, the Rohingyas expelled to, to um, Bangladesh. And this has been an issue that has been, that the ICC has tried to deal with. But Myanmar is not, is not a party to the International Criminal Court and it has been very difficult. Then, what happened on last Monday was that Gambia brought Myanmar before the International Court of Justice in The Hague, which is the top body, which is that has all uh, international law as its, its jurisdiction, uh, and including um, a treaties with, uh, dealing with, with war crimes and Gambia. So Gambia brings Myanmar with the support of um, the, uh, I can't remember, it's, it's, it's 
then my uh, body almost came. There is collision almost in the countries. Bringing this case to, to the International Court of Justice. Which is really interesting and a new term because that's the first uh, war crimes case of this kind before the International Court of Justice. On Wednesday, two days later, a case was brought against the military and civil leadership of Argentina, including Aung San Suu Kyi, under the, the universal jurisdiction. Uh, for a range of crimes, but not genocide, because it's not part of under the Argentinian law. But, but the same week, we have the case in Gambia, bringing Myanmar before the International Criminal Court, and we have the leadership brought before the courts in Argentina. Uh, what's interesting is that the reason why it's brought in Argentina is that the main person bringing the court had previously been a special rapporteur, UN rapporteur, to Myanmar, and was really frustrated for the lack of international action and saw this as a possibility to bring the case. And then on Thursday, the International Criminal Court approved a full investigation. They decided that the, since, uh, since Bangladesh was a member, the, and most of the, the refugees were in Bangladesh, a lot of, of the crimes were, could be investigated within, within their jurisdiction. So, uh, I think last week brought a lot, a lot of new perspectives and a lot of new actors into this field of international uh, accountability for grave human rights violations. And of course it's early to see what will happen with these cases, but at least it's very interesting. It's a very interesting job. So, so of course, the, from what I've said now, it's not a big surprise that, of course, there is there are challenges uh, ahead. And I think um, so. I'm not sure. I mean, at least in some parts of the world, there is a dwindling support for human rights in international courts. More generally, there is a. It doesn't have sort of the strong push. Uh, a political, uh, political force that, that we've seen, but of course it's still very, very substantial. But that is a worry, I think, for most people who are concerned. Uh, there is a clear legitimacy on funding issues. So many, many, if you look at the Inter-American Court of Human Rights, Venezuela has withdrawn. Many, uh, several other countries have indicated that they might. Many countries, including Brazil, has, has when they have disliked rulings against them, they've stopped funding. Um, there is, uh, as I said, the ICC has seen, uh, seen uh, several states uh, withdrawing or threatening to withdraw. Uh, there is, so, so the fact that they're, they're, so, they're also, of course, depending on the states for funding, so that also creates uh, special funding uh, challenges. But what we're seeing, and, that, and we're also seeing that, for instance, in, in, uh, in Eastern Europe, a lot of the uh, leaders, for instance, in Hungary, Poland, they have a much more anti-liberal stance. They're, they're talking about illiberal democracy in a way that that we haven't seen so much in earlier times. But what's maybe more challenging, in a way, is that the traditional protagonists are less supportive of international accountability. Those, those are the countries who traditionally have been very, very strong in backing these international, uh, international bodies. Of course, the US, which always is, is, is um, a bit problematic, it usually pushes a lot for having most of these bodies, but because it's so difficult in the US to ratify conventions, they're usually not party to them, but they've turned really, really uh, against these bodies under, uh, under Trump. Brexit has also been a lot about the trying to diminish um, international influence, including the influence of the national, the European Court of Human Rights. The European Court of Justice has been central in the debates. Uh, but also countries like Norway, Denmark, Sweden, and the Netherlands. And I just want to show some, some pictures. So, that's what uh, the optional protocol to the International Covenant on Economic, Social and Cultural Rights. Optional protocols are usually always, or many of these optional protocols, in, including this one, is actually uh, a commitment that individuals within the countries can bring cases to these 
bodies. So, if you're in Spain or France or Italy, you can bring, and you feel that your human rights are violated, you have the possibility to bring the case to the international committee and you can also check out your rights. If you're in Norway, you can't, or in Sweden, or in Hungary. If you're in Finland, you can. And that is the same. That, that's the same. So these are the, the blue countries. Uh, the countries and children who feel that their rights are violated can bring their case to the Committee on the Rights of the Child. So, but, so if you're in Denmark, you can. If you're in Finland, you can. If you're in uh, Norway, we know the Netherlands, you can't. If you the adoption protocol on the Convention of the Rights of Persons with Disabilities. So the 3rd of December is the right, it's the day for the disability right. If you are, if you are most parts of the world, most African countries, most Latin American countries, in Canada, much of Europe, you can bring if you're a disabled person, you can bear, bring your case to the committee for the rights of persons with disabilities. In Sweden, you can. In Denmark, you can. In Norway, you can't. In the Netherlands, you can't. So, this is... And then, this is, is just to show another picture that really shows the politics of it. So, this is, this is the map showing which countries have ratified and say, or signed the International Convention on the Protection of the Rights of all migrant workers and members of their families. And what we see with this here is, uh, is that very few of those countries who are main receivers of migrants have, have uh, signed or ratified this convention. So, so, just to conclude, the, the, it is a concern when countries like Norway, Sweden and Denmark and the Netherlands, who have traditionally been pushing for uh, international human rights accountability, are withdrawing from, so they're signing the conventions, but they're saying not for my, not for my, not for us. We don't want to subject ourselves to this, this international accountability. That is a problem. It's not necessarily so much a problem for the individuals in the countries, because there are other mechanisms that can be used in many cases. Many of these cases can be taken to the European Court of, of Human Rights. But it is a problem for the project of international human rights accountability. If countries like the Scandinavian countries are saying we don't really thank you, but thank you. So, so uh, that is that's, that is a, is a problem. That is maybe as much a problem adding to the legitimacy and, uh, issue and the, and the final issue. Um, but what we do see, uh, as we saw last week, is that there are new, new actors who are using these and who are taking lead. Gambia is interesting. There is also a Gambian prosecutor at the International Criminal Court. So they're actually very involved in, in the Rainbow case. There are, there are uh, other actors taking lead, which is interesting. And also, there are new issues that are being subject to international law. Fair. And I think maybe one of the most interesting ones is the, is the climate change cases that are being taken to different courts. Because these are issues that are so difficult to handle politically. It was so difficult to handle at the state level. There is so much need of international accountability. And, and that is also, uh, and I think that to recognize that these are, of course, arenas for politics, but they are arenas for politics that are different, that are taking more long-term uh, views of, of, of what politics is, and that also um, are forums where arguments are heard in a different way where um, uh, science can be put to, uh, to the, the, 
and different types of evidence can be put to the judges as part of, of the argument and part of the decision makes it it makes the political balance and power, power different. And it makes sort of the, the potential for, for making different types of, 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 uh, of decisions. So, so that is what I'm maybe hoping, because there is so much need for uh, international for, for accountability in these cases. But that is also where I believe that the, the international accountability can continue to be very important in the future. So thank you. That, that's a very interesting question. It's a very, very good question. And it, of course, it remains to be seen. I think, I think there has, so I put it a bit in black and white. There are a lot of African actors who have been very supportive of, uh, and Asian and Latin American, who have been very supportive of these, these international courts and tribunals for a long time. And it's usually um, actors who are feeling the, Heat, who are making the arguments of of uh, neocolonialism. So it's also partly a political argument and partly a strategic argument. Although it also resonates. So it's it's a little bit of both. But I do think it is, uh, and that's one of the reasons why I put it up. I think that that the more varied actors who are finding it these fora useful for pursuing their the, the joint human rights agenda, international joint human rights agenda, but also using it for, for as, as area, area, areas that are useful for them. I think that is necessary if it's, if it's going to, yeah, I mean, if you want to be a world court, that is definitely what needs to be done. So I, yes, I think it is. I think the arguments will continue to come, but, but I do think it is important. area, which has to do with harassment and possibly violation of human rights, but I'm not sure, at workplaces, especially mm -hmm. workplaces related to governmental bodies like ministries mm -hmm. or, would that be considered an area of, of, of interest for international welfare is something falling under this um, specific Yes, there are uh, the issues of, of uh, her, uh, different types of harassment at the workplace. Of course, that's a big, that's a big range. range. Uh, but of course, uh, there are cases before the human rights bodies that concern uh, harassment at the workplace. So it's 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 a common play area for bringing cases. So in that sense, it's an old, it's an old area in which cases have been brought. But it is also, and I think maybe that's what you were asking about, it's also part becoming increasingly uh, the whole issue of gender-based violence, particularly, is, is becoming an issue that is also part of this, this lawfare field that I was talking about with around sexual and reproductive rights. That the particularly actors who are trying to combat what they see as gender ideology are also taking on gender-based violence as something that should not either be 
part of the privacy of the family or not be seen as gender-based. That should be reframed and rephrased. So that is also part of it. It has not been... Um, I don't think that we are seeing sort of the big, uh, particularly on the pro-sexual reproductive rights side, I'm not sure that we're seeing a big agenda emerging in this, in this field that is international in that sense. But, but it is definitely part of the, part of the field. It's not so much a question, it's more a comment that I was very happy to hear that you are positive about the possibility in terms of the climate debate. Because as I was hearing your talk, I, I sort of, in a sense, that exactly is the case that makes me feel more depressed than any of the other yeah. cases. Because this seems to be the case that may break mm. the, the entire system because the major countries were also the major participants in the pollution, like the mm -hmm. US and China and India, uh, are also the countries who refuse to participate. Mm. And if those who you know, are the major contributors to the violations refuse to think, mm. you know, participate, then it seems that what is the point with the international mm -hmm. law? But, but you, you, you are positive that this will... So, one of one of the things that I haven't said that is sort of important, an important driver, as maybe I indicated, but that is an important driver of international mm. lawfare is public attention. Mm. And I think one of the reasons why, one of the reasons why we saw all these court, the, the court cases from Ga the Gambia and from uh, Argentina is not necessarily because Argentina don't think that they will be able to get extradited the leaders from Myanmar and, and, and or and so Suu Kyi. But they want to they, they want to make a moral case, but they also want to get attention back to the on the issue which they feel are dwindling. And I think one of the reasons why it's attractive arenas is that it is a way of not only uh, getting attention, but also really getting detailed attention to the problem and the possible solutions. And I think, uh, so I think that's one of the reasons why I think it is an imp important in an area where there is so much misinformation, but also so many political uh, issues uh, engaged. And we are seeing, so there is not one court, international court for climate change, but there are climate change cases across a lot of different uh, international court and treaties and domestically uh, and for now most domestically because they're working their way but but I think that there are a lot of cases that are not necessarily against the companies there are some but there are also cases that most of the cases that win in the courts are against states for failure to regulate and for failure to to protect uh, future generations and 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 uh, and also their own populations. So I think, so I think I don't think that that international courts can solve the issue of climate change. But I think that the international courts and domestic courts, but international courts can be part of a part of a way of bringing climate policy, policies forward, and an important part of it. And I and I think that that is one of the areas where we're seeing a lot of innovation in terms of the types of remedies that are given and the the types of cases that are being brought, mm. and they are getting getting a lot of attention. So, so it's 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 very interesting. These are domestic level decisions, but when in Colombia and in uh, in India, when rivers are given status as persons, and governments are are ordered to protect the the rights of the river or the Amazon more than they do, that's a way of saying okay, companies can be persons, rivers can also be persons. We need to sort of find a way to make a balance. That's interesting. When in New York, in one of the cases brought in New York now, one of the the, the, the court accepted that one of the other the, the, that to to accept and advocate one of the parties would speak on behalf of future generations. So future generations were brought in as parties to the case. It's very very interesting. It's a very innovative and interesting way of dealing with issues where that are really, really difficult politically mm. 
for so many reasons, and partly for reasons of time horizon, we need sort of actors who are able to bring more long-term uh, policies. I have a couple of questions, and I will stop just with one. The, 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 the brief one, or comment. It was very interesting what you said about the, the cases against uh, the Norwegian Child Protection mm -hmm. Services. Uh, I, in my mind, thought that it was just that the Norwegian Child Protection Services were just so, you know, that there is a different family ideology that is underlying all this. But then when you mentioned that there is actually an institution that is Many. This was running just one. these cases. Mm. Uh, no, so they're not running them. Okay. They're not running them. Uh, as I said, I think in these cases, as in most of the cases that come in these lawfare processes, they're not bringing them. So, on the, I think on the, on the conscientious objection cases, both in, in Sweden and Norway, it's more of a urging. There is more involvement in the in the in the decision to go to court, that's more of a political case to start. With. But then, well, both of them also in a way. But but the but these cases are not. I mean, they're brought by parents who have who have gone through the court system and to who go to the International Court of Human Rights, the European Court of Human Rights, because that's their last chance, or because they want want to have recognition of the violation. But what we're seeing is that. Uh, or the Euros and other activists, it's just one of the, the... They have an extreme interest in what's happening in Norway and uh, around the Norwegian Child Protection Services. And, the, and in terms of the protests, there are international actors who are sort of important in, in, in staging the protests, but also that they engage in the court cases. They give, they give uh, evidence or they give uh, amicus briefs. They, they explain to the court why this is wrong. And, and that is interesting, that they, they see these cases are important. They're not bringing them, but they see them as very important. But it's interesting why we see so many cases against Norway. So, uh, it's, one reason is that it's a lot easier for Norwegians to bring cases to the Norwegian Court of Human Rights. You have a lot of support to bring the cases. It's much more difficult to bring cases from any other countries, but that's only one. Of course, it's also because because uh, if you get one and that's successful, there will be more. That's something that we often see. Um, and there is also quite a movement in Norway uh, against the child protection services. And of course, the, there has been an increase, for instance, in, in removals from families in Norway. So there are also some of the, that is also one of the reasons that it would probably the child protection services in Norway will be better for what's happening in the courts. But it's, but it is, it's a complex phenomenon, but, but what is, and I'm not saying that these are sort of only political processes, but what I'm saying is that there are, it's also that, and it's also sort of a, a more European and global, actually, uh, process that we're seeing, or not seeing, but that is there. Already, then where things were going, and that. 
It would be, a, of course, it's impossible for me to know, but it's a very interesting reflection. I had never thought yeah. about that before, but yeah. my, uh, my mind yeah. added, this is my mind. I agree, but I think it's uh, it's uh, it's fa uh, really fascinating that Beckett is coming. It's something to look into. Yeah, absolutely. Okay, any further thoughts and questions? If not, we will thank you one more time. I'm just very tempted to say that I know you all from a very, very long time. <laughs> you know that? You know. So we actually went to grade school together. Oh. <laughs> so I think we should actually send them all together. <laughs> I think she would say we should. Yes. <laughs> Well, oh, yeah. I'm sure you.